Welcome to the Future Thinkers. I'm Matthew Hoddenock, and on the first Tuesday of every month, we choose a topic to discuss with an invited panel of members to establish what the topic's going to look like in three, five, 10, 20 years' time. Last month, we talked about the future of events, our hopes, our aspirations, in as positive a manner as we could at the time. Since then, the country is looking forward to opening up, and so slowly is the events industry. Tonight, I'm sat here looking a little bit like Ron Burgundy, dressed for a job interview, COVID hair, and in the traditional 2021 Zoom attire of shirts, tie, and boxer shorts to discuss tonight's topic that will concern us all in one way or another. You're not meant to be laughing at this. In one way or another, what is the future of employment? How is employment going to look in the years to come? Are we going to become individual micro-businesses who come together, form, disband, and then come back together again as projects require? Or in some dystopian fulfillment of George Orwell's 1984, become state-controlled drones whereby we're handed employment by the governing power? Last year's COVID spanner has already shown us that we probably can't predict the future. But my panel tonight will be able to share their opinions and insights of where we're going. And as we do on each session, I'll let the panel introduce themselves. Tonight, I'm joined by Chris Murdoch, Sue Pardy, Anne Telfrey, and Michelle Humer, all time-served employers, employees, recruiters, and recruitees. So without any further ado, and I can see them waiting to see which one I'm going to come to first, I'll ask everyone to do a quick introduction, just building the suspense, and ask Michelle first. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> because he got my surname pronounced correctly, isn't it? You thought I'm confident. <laughs> That's exactly it, Michelle. Welcome <laughs> to the season then. Oh, well, hello. Uh, my name is Michelle Fumer. I am a recruiter and business owner based in Milton Keynes. I've been in recruitment for 23 years. Um, so just a, a quick flash in the pan, job for me. Um, traditionally, been an accountancy and HR recruiter over the last year or so, have really diversified into other areas really to support candidates and clients um, as they've gone through quite difficult times recently. I'm a qualified careers counsellor and uh, I'm a bit sad. I love anything to do with the world of work. That's me. Thanks ever so much, Michelle. I, I really enjoyed talking to you the other day and understanding the holistic way that, that you do your recruitment business based very much on the values of the businesses and also the people. It's not just one size fits all. So thank you ever so much for joining us, Michelle. No so, at all. Sue, so, welcome to this evening. Hi there. Hi, thank you, Matthew. Um, so I'm Sue Pardy, and I've been running my own HR consultancy business, which is face-to-face -face HR in Milton Keynes for about five years now. Um, my clients are micro and small businesses across many industries, from uh, something as interesting as a performing arts school to a double glazing recycling company. Wow. Uh, before starting my business, I've acquired at least 25 years, I think, slightly beat Michelle on that, um, HR experience working in the corporate world for companies such as Accenture, Amazon and the OU. And I've been lucky enough to spend uh, five years in Brisbane, in Australia, working uh, in HR for a big uh, bank and insurance company. So I've been able to travel the world with uh, HR um, as well. Thanks ever so much, Sue. And I'm trying to work out today, you've given it away with the 25 years, how long I've actually known you. And I think that's just slightly 30 odd plus years when it we were be. in university together. Yes. No yeah. stories about the university days. Yeah, Sue, not for now. Tonight. We haven't got time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll come to you next. Um, please welcome to this evening and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, thank you. And many thanks for the invitation to join you this evening. My name's Anne Tolfrey. Um, I'm currently a senior resourcing business partner for DHL Supply Chain. I've worked for them for seven years now, and my current role is that I recruit for all of our senior operations positions uh, across the UK. So anything from a general manager, operations director and vice presidents within our supply chain business. Um, so I'll bring a logistics focus to this evening, if that's all right with you. Um, 
if we're adding up our tenure years of, of recruitment here, I think we're doing pretty well. I can bring about 18 years to the mix. Uh, so I've previously been an agency recruiter and was also an in-house recruiter. Of recruitment people, I just think it's fascinating. So excited to be here. Oh, lovely. And thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you coming along and joining us this evening. I'm just trying to move my screen and find our last guest, which is Chris this evening. Sorry to leave you to the end. Uh, Chris, welcome to us. Yeah, thanks ever so much, Matthew. And thanks for the invitation. But um, yeah, so my name is Chris Murdoch. I'm the co-founder of a uh, recruitment marketing uh, tech platform called Voice. Um, so yeah, in summary, we, we just make it really easy for talent leaders to create really cool and engaging candidate experiences for culture hubs, for uh, digital job descriptions. Um, it's very much based on um, video job specs and embedding, embedding video job specs in, in cool experiences. But yeah, prior to that, um, similar to the rest of the panel, I've, I've been in recruitment for most of my um, kind of adult career. So um, yeah, left left school, did my A-levels and jumped straight into agency recruitment, um, then ran my own um, tech recruitment agency for about eight years before, uh, yeah, uh, found Invoice with um, a couple of other people about four years ago. Fantastic, Chris. Thank you so much again for joining us this evening, Chris. So. No, yeah. So we'll get on with the first question this evening. Um, and, and our aim of the discussion over the next um, 50 minutes or so is to really try and paint a picture of, of what employment in particular is going to look like, not just from an employer's point of view, but also from an employee's point of view. And that's one of the questions I'm going to be asking a little bit later on. But the very first question, and I'll come to you, Anne, if that's OK to start with. Um, the very first question I want to ask, with all of your years and wealth of experience that we've heard about so far, is what's the biggest change we've seen in employment in the last 10 years? I think one of the biggest changes, and there are a few, um, but I think one of the biggest changes is really around the flexible working pattern that we've seen emerge. Um, I think that there's been a real um, increase in the service sector, which in itself generates um, a need for part time work, for short term contracts, for zero hour contracts. And then we obviously have the gig economy, um, which is a very new phenomenon, which I think in theory, should work really well because it should allow you to work around um, your own domestic requirements and work whenever you can. The downside of it is, of course, that there is a real lack of rights around that. So a real lack of rights to the, the minimum wage, holiday pay, sick pay. Um, and I think we're coming full circle around the, um, the free movement of, of labour within the within the EU. That was a, a huge change within the last decade and you know sadly is is stopping again now and i think i think a number of uh, new job roles seem to have been created i mean who would have thought that you could be a youtuber or a, or an influencer a decade ago and now you know that's a that's a way to make some pretty big bucks i think at the at the moment so that would be my my take on it mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think I um I spoke in some schools a year or so ago and um I and I'm showing my age now compared to you really, and I mentioned the fact that who would have thought you could actually take a phone anywhere you wanted to go to um as a job. So working for O2 that hadn't even existed when I left the university. And you're mentioning YouTubers and everything. And I think that's really graphic as to how how the employment market, the whole job scene changes, isn't it? It's it's such a rapidly moving um focus chris what's your take on this i think the biggest shift um has been the, the movement from the reliance on recruitment agencies um to internal talent teams now having a real strong grasp of how to attract talent themselves um i think rewinding in my agency days you know going back a decade ago Companies really, you know, there are very, very few companies that, that really knew how to attract and engage talent themselves. You know, the dependency and reliance on, on agencies was, was really, really high. And I think now talent teams internally in businesses and also businesses understanding that they need to invest in talent teams themselves as opposed to outsourcing that complete job to agencies. But that, that's probably one of the biggest shifts that, that I've seen. And 
you know, these talent teams that are embedded in some of these organisations now do such an amazing job of really kind of, you know, managing to create awesome employer brands, creating amazing content internally to kind of showcase culture and all this great stuff. But I, I think, you know, that for me has been probably the biggest shift, that reliance on agencies to companies now really starting to understand how to, to, to attract and engage people themselves. Yeah, thank you. That's that's one of the things, Chris, isn't it, that you see on um, email titles nowadays is, is talent acquisition, or I'm, I'm sure on, on Anne's um, email title will we'll have the word talent in there as well. And, and that's, that's a, again, taking up on Anne's point as a, a new shift, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's, um, and you know, the, the, these internal talent teams, they're, they're obviously so well positioned to to, to sell the culture, to, to, to firstly, you know, really understand the culture, really understand the individual teams, the individual leaders, and, you know, just, you know, what it's like to work in those businesses. So they're obviously the very, they're so well placed to, to then go and find the right people for those businesses. But, but yeah, you're right, you know, going back 10 years ago, you, you just didn't really see, you know, huge teams of talent acquisition specialists working directly for businesses. But yeah, that's, that, yeah. that's, been, that's been a definite shift in the last decade or so, I think. Definitely. And, and Michelle, you must have a, um, a take on this from as a, as a recruitment consultant. Yeah, I think we saw a definite shift going into managed suppliers and uh, people like the bigger agencies going in and managing the recruitment. And that didn't necessarily work because along with what Chris said, they didn't have the buy in or the understanding of the culture. Um, yeah. There was quite a lot of staff turnover within those agencies who were dealing with those pieces of recruitment and those projects and then we reverted back to uh, recruiting talent teams um, and I'm glad to say at least recruitment agencies are involved with recruiting the talent teams to be in the company um, and then from there I think it's changed again certainly in the last year there are a lot of businesses who perhaps haven't given out too many roles in the last couple of years prior to 2020 because they were trying to keep the costs down and doing that recruitment internally um, and that's changed slightly. And last year, certainly, a lot of um, larger clients with those talent teams come back out to the market to say to me, we're experiencing real problems. And I, I think the biggest change for me is candidate shortage. Um, candidate availability is the toughest driver because if they can't find those people and they don't always have access to the networks that these recruiters have, then luckily, if the relationships are strong, we're the backup for those talent teams to be able to say, you can't find them let's work together and let's try and help and as I always say to the talent teams I work with look I'm here to make you look good because although you might not have found the, the candidate directly if you find the right candidate that's the name of the game that's the goal is to, to build your teams and strengthen them with the right people but I think candidate shortage is the biggest concern for me as a recruiter recruiting daily moving forwards. And that's, uh, forgive my ignorance, Michelle, on, on what we're talking about, but that, that's a really surprising thing to hear, given however many people are going to have been made redundant over the last year. I was, I was reading the statistics today that mm -hmm. January, actually, we've, we've got an increase in the number of people in, um, in employment, but still huge numbers over the last year have become more available to employers, haven't they? They have, and I think there's a whole education piece around what the marketplace is like now candidates yeah. coming back into the marketplace a lot of people would have been employed for a long period of time and they won't recognize the marketplace when they come into it to look for a job so there's that support needed in order for them to have a good cv to have good yeah. interview practice to know how to present themselves to know where to go to look for the jobs and a lot of them perhaps have been more in a traditional agency route where they i have, I have people now more than ever bringing me that's quite an unusual thing. It used to be that everyone would just send their CV and or send an email, but lots of people have gone back to phoning and saying, I just wanted to have a chat. And then you have a conversation with someone and you realise there's a lot of counselling, I guess, involved around the job search at the moment because people are being made yeah. available for a period of time. But I think the availability of candidates is something that the press tells us there's lots and lots of people who are unemployed, who are being made redundant. We naturally assume that they're all going to be looking for a job and we're going to have a really good candidate pool to go to but I could have advertised a finance director role in 2019 and had 100 responses of which 50 would be on the long list before I started shortlisting. Nowadays wow. I can advertise the same role 
to get the same numbers, but I'd probably get down to a quality of 10 within that response. Um, and I think, I mean, I make a joke about it, but I say you can advertise a qualified accountant and get a lot of roller skating waiters apply. But it is very true of any role. People are unfortunately slightly desperate, slightly worried. And so they are applying for anything. There's a real scattergun approach. So it looks at first glance like there's a lot of people in the marketplace, but it's about the quality of the people and the suitability for the roles. Oh, brilliant, Michelle. And, and Sue, coming, coming to you um, lastly on this particular question, you, you must um, come almost from, from the opposing angle that, um, you know, if once, once the recruitment role has been done, you're um, to, to, to manage the ability of the employer once they join the business. So what, what's your take on, on the biggest change over the last 10 years? So well, I was thinking about this and, and I agree very much with um, Anne's point. I was thinking about the increase in the gig economy. I mean, 10 years ago, we'd never heard that phrase. Um, mm. So, you know, companies like Uber, Deliveroo, all of those sort of things didn't exist. Um, probably didn't exist, I don't know, five years ago even, but it, it's changed a lot. So you've got so many more people on zero hour contracts, casual contracts, freelance, etc. So that's changed the way of working a lot more. I think equally, we've got the aging population. 10 years ago, uh, this year, we lost the default retirement age. So um, we've now got, you know, there is no limit to when people uh, can, can stop, need to stop working. So people can continue. So you've got that increased pool but then that brings in uh increased uh issues within the workplace about whether people are physically able to do jobs when they're older um you know do they have poor health if they're not leaving then there's no jobs further down the line and and things like that so that's a, a, another area of um concern another thing accessibility so a few years ago, you know, with the advent of smartphones, we didn't have access to either our employees or our employer as readily as we do now. Now we regularly WhatsApp them. So conversations have become much more informal and potentially the work relationship has become more informal. And equally, they can... Wow they can talk to us much more regularly and out of hours. So the sort of nine to five doesn't exist anymore. And obviously with everybody working from home recently, it's, it's even, you know, it, it's changed a lot. And then a couple more points on that. So the accessibility and, and employers being able to access employees a lot more regularly and contact them more regularly. We've obviously had the increase in mental health, you know, perhaps 10 years ago, there was, you know, we didn't talk about mental health as much as we do. We've made great leaps on mental health awareness. We've still got a long way to go. But 10 years ago, it definitely probably wasn't a subject that was on employers agenda. And now we have mental health first aiders in the workplace. And my final thought on this, just for throwing it in there, is I think that employees, potentially because of more awareness, more um, uh, accessibility to the internet, etc., they're more litigious. So yeah. I, I find that employees know their rights a lot more than they perhaps did years ago. And therefore, they're much more happy to press buttons and to um, take employers further um, maybe to challenge in a tribunal because we've lost the fees to the tribunals about three years ago so loads of changes and loads of wow. implications loads of good things but loads of not necessarily bad things but just it's just different so I'm, I'm just going to pick up on a couple of points that you make made there so I, I, I love the idea of the aging population nearly being there myself it's, <laughs> it's obviously really, really relevant to me but and before um, you <laughs> <laughs> well yeah um but one, one of the things that um i mean I, I i lecture on on designing communities and things like that and one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is the 60 plus generation having the most amount of wealth um in their back pockets so if we're designing a community and if you want to earn a little bit extra on on you know value added community then you design it for that so in 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 reality in terms of the job market is that going to be one of the biggest disruptors that we're going to be facing is this this lack of place in 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 the job market um at the moment for that, for that age group 
<laughs> just in general. I mean, if, if, like you said, if, if people aren't moving on, are the, are the oh. jobs not going to become available? Well, I suppose that there's no such thing also nowadays as a job for life. And, and maybe yeah. that's why we've, you know, we have got more of this portfolio career that, again, a phrase that we'd not come across 10 years ago. So more people have chop and change. So it'd be interesting to hear from the recruiters in the room, uh, you know, how off, how you know it used to be you don't didn't touch the cv when people moved around you know every two years they changed their jobs you know oh we don't want them they're not going to stay but my yeah. view is that's very very old-fashioned nowadays you know tell me if i'm wrong guys um but you know that you 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 would be you know there's hardly any cvs where people don't move around nowadays but yet employers <laughs> still constantly ask for <laughs> Stability on a CV. Yeah, they don't want to consider somebody who's moved on, and yet millennials, for example, have an expectation to move every two years. Yeah. So, so, so we're guessing. In, we're, we're guessing into the position, and, and we may already be here. Anne and Michelle, you, you'll be able to tell me this, but um, you. Um, I'm sorry, what a question has just come up on my screen and completely thrown me. I do apologise. <laughs> um, but we're, we're getting to the position Multitask. where the <laughs> the uh, I can't I can't multitask. Um, where the millennials, that's going to be the biggest proportion of the workforce, isn't it? You know, they yeah. are the, the the biggest proportion of that. Is is that going to have a disproportionate effect? How? What's your view on that, Anne? Well, I think at the moment the the, the workplace is possibly. <laughs> Um, of the landscape is possibly the most um, diverse age group that we've ever had we have so many different generations I can't I don't even know what they all are there's like a Z and an X and a millennial isn't yeah. there and I don't know which one I am but um, there are Alpha so many of us <laughs> um, they all have different needs so everybody you know they like to be managed differently. We like to um, be trained differently. We need different needs, such as Sue was referring to, perhaps around you know health and well-being, um, access to different benefits. And I can't remember what the question was, but it was definitely something. What was the question? I, I like your answer. You don't know either. You don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's absolutely something that employers and companies have to consider. And it's something that, you know, that we work really hard at, at DHL. I think we've got a number of really strong networks created around race, around gender, around LGBTQ+. We have mental health first aiders, such as Sue was saying. We have a great benefit suite. This is becoming a bit of a DHL advert. I am aware of that. But, <laughs> yeah, um, honestly, you're fine, Anne. It is, it is a real changing landscape. And I don't think we've ever had this many different generations in the workplace at once. And that is something to be considered on its, on its own, really. Yeah, it's not something I'd really thought of, but yeah, you must have people from 18, I think that's now the school leaving age, 18 to 70 plus, mustn't you? So it's, 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 a, it's a huge span. How, and I'll come to you, Michelle, with, from a, from a, the, the pastoral sort of care that you offer to um, to recruit uh, recruitees. How, how does a recruitee prepare for joining this sort of workplace now? Yeah, it's a difficult one. I think when I I've talked to lots of school leavers. I did a session with a school this morning, and they were year nine, so thirteen and fourteen years old. And the jobs that they wanted to do, going back to what Anne said at the beginning, like influencers and YouTubers and I was expecting a few more premiership footballers, but they wanted to be um, civil engineers and architects. And three of them said business owner, which wow. I was really pleased with. Um, and they wanted to, and I, and I said, well, why do you say that? What is it about that, that you know, wants you to lead you towards that? And there were various reasons, having more money, being the boss, being in control, being in charge of your own destiny great answer for a 14 year old um, and it, it kind of made me realize that they are more switched on they're a bit more entrepreneurial perhaps than certain generations and they don't set restrictive boundaries for themselves mm -hmm. so I find sometimes that with a mix of ages in the workplace it can be really useful if they can communicate effectively with each other and I don't know how many businesses I'd be interested to hear actually from the other panelists whether larger businesses around all the programs of inclusivity and diversity, whether the inclusive part also helps intergenerational communication, because I actually think that would be really, really useful. Um, having just placed a couple of ladies in their middle, middle 60s 
as PAs for a chief exec because they came from a traditional, proper, old-fashioned secretary uh, background and they could do everything that he needed them to do in the job. And I think in his mind, he thought, well, I'm going to get someone who's in their early 20s, maybe um, straight out of college, and this is what I need, and somebody really switched on. But they didn't need to do the marketing. They didn't need to do the sort of techie stuff, as it, as it were. They were, needed to be traditional PAs. So to place a couple of people in their 60s is, is a real joy for me because you're utilising talent and skill that has been earned over a lifetime. But then what I would like to see is more companies then utilising those individuals to help train up people who perhaps don't have skills in certain areas, they haven't been taught to them because they are more technically connected, but perhaps lose a little bit of the, the people facing skills and, and the second guessing, reading a person as opposed to just reading a, a phone, being able to understand culturally what's going to work when working within a business. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what's your, your, sorry. No, I was just going to say that's really interesting. I had this very similar conversation with um, my boss actually a few weeks ago, Michelle, when we were talking around um, the, the mix of people in the business and the different skills that they, bring, that they bring. And you're right around the communication, but I do think that whereby the the sort of the training that we offer offers uh, one communal language, which I think helps. But I think the mix around... Um, having a few years of experience I think gives you credibility you know how to manage challenging stakeholders you know how to manage upwards you also know when to stop talking and you know that's in itself I think is a bit of a skill so it's those sort of softer skills those sort of behaviors that I think are really valuable that um you know older people can help the younger generation because I think those things you actually just have to learn and I think your point around placing those those two ladies that, that you placed it would have also have been around you know the person fit wouldn't it it would have also have been around yeah. you know and that's something that you know that you bring as a recruiter but I think I think it is around just because they're different age groups doesn't mean there isn't commonality and I think if we are we are recruiting on behavioral based um, competencies now more so than skills because often you can teach people the skills can't you but you know I think people want or employers want the 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 requirement to be sort of agile and adaptable and have that empathy and you know have the emotional intelligence but you know have a bit of something about you it's all of that that you can have whatever age you are really yeah. I think mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree with you Anne and and one of my things we were talking about last week on, on something, I think it was Clubhouse, was about values and about um, an organization's values. And if you recruit to those, they're, they're universal. They're not, um, yeah. they're not age barriers. You can have those when you're 18. You can have those when you're 77. Mm -hmm. and, and if you use those to recruit, then you'll get hopefully a good mix and diverse. You know, when I say the word diversity, I mean... I don't just mean that the sort of the, the words that we usually associate it with it, but you know, people who are neurodiverse, people who um, you know, different age groups, um, you know, different backgrounds, social economic backgrounds, and things like that. You should hopefully get that mix, which adds to a really good flavour for your company, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. so, this was um, one of the things we were talking about, wasn't it? Um, so in in there was was I think I think we mentioned the CIA on on the clubhouse com yes. conference and yes. this mixture of backgrounds um, which led them to not being able to find Osama bin Laden for example because of all the cultural backgrounds and how businesses with which draw from the same pool of people really end up being very beige in colour. What's your take on this, Chris? You've been sat ever so, ever so quiet um, on the side of my screen, Chris. So I'm, I'm really sorry not to have brought you into the conversation well, I've, earlier. I've been taking it all in some really, really good points. I think there's there's lots of, of, of good things that have come up. I think one of the really interesting things is that, um, you know, companies seem to be, and, and the recruiters amongst us, which I'm, I'm still certainly part of, that, uh, part of that field, by the way, but, you know, businesses are so keen, you know, how can we attract, Gen Z, how can we attract millennials? How can we infuse you know, our values into the way we attract and engage people? But I think there is a massive disconnect with you know, the, the older generations, especially now, you know, people are working well into their 70s, you know, well into their 70s, whereas historically, you know, they, they haven't been. And you know, somebody that's um, you know, 
60 years old, for example, they're, they're not old and they've still got so much value to add. And I think there is a bit of a misconception um, with companies and probably recruiters, you know, everywhere that are uh, no, probably not quite right. Probably, you know, we probably need to recruit somebody much younger that can stay with us for a much longer period of time. And that, you know, for whatever reason, they're, they're cast aside unnecessarily. And I think when we talk about diversity and inclusivity, um, I think you know, it's probably my own opinion, but I think that particular generation is, is actually still cast aside in that in that conversation and wrongly so. Um, so that's a key thing. But yeah, one of the really interesting points that you brought up, Sue, around values. And I think, you know, 99% of companies have values and they spend a lot of time creating values and really understanding what their values are. But they're, they're pretty bad at actually communicating that message when they go out to market to try and attract people. And I think that's a real problem and a real disconnect. And, you know, their values, I think, like you rightly said, you know, should be one of the strongest hooks in, you know, how they put their message together about who they are, what they're passionate about, um, and, and, you know, transferring that into how they go and attract, you know, various talent pools. Um, But, yeah, in my experience, um, yeah, the values-based recruitment is really underutilised. And it's, you know, so many companies are missing a real trick with... uh, you know, not not getting a grasp of that. I, I think I think that's really um, really really valid uh, for what you were saying, Chris. And, and one of the things that it brings me nicely onto, I think, is um, that, that I've been pondering on as as we've had this this discussion um, is who who where where does the the balance of of contract actually lie? Is it with the employer still, or is it with the employee? And I know. When I was, um, I can see Sue chuckling. <laughs> um, when I was, when I first started, started the job, or when I first started in, in employment, it, it was a fearful thing when you when you joined the business because, you know, there was there was a lot of pressure to it. But I think you know, have things changed nowadays? Has is 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 there more respect to the contract between to the con of the contract? Sorry, between employer and employee. Is there more of a balance in that? Do you, do you have a view on that, Chris? Yeah, I, th- I think it's um, it's it's a funny one, really. So I think so many of the companies that I've worked with over the years, they, they feel like the power's with them. It's like, well, you know, if this person mm. has an interview process or, you know, if they're not prepared to accept our offer right here on the spot, then we don't want them. They're not right for us. Um, and it's all, it's that kind of old school dictator mentality a lot of companies have. They're like, well, you know, we're... IBM and you know if they don't want us then we don't want them type mentality and and I think really you know the 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 sooner come you know not all companies are like that of course they're not but I think the sooner you know businesses kind of allow more power in the 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 candidates hands you know the sooner they'll kind of realize that they're going to get access to 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 the very best people because you know it's 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 a candidate's or a contractor's right to assess the market understand all their options and, um, you know, I think that I think the sooner, you know, organisations kind of stop being so precious about that kind of high almighty, right, we're in power, this is our recruitment campaign, we're a great company, and we, we can dictate what goes on in the process. As soon as they kind of drop some of those barriers, I think they'll, they, they typically have more success and have access to, to better, better people and better talent pools. Um, I'm going to come to you, and I know you're expecting this, Anne, but I'm going to come to you next um, and just see what, what your take on, on that is, because DHL have grown massively, haven't you, over the last few years with huge infrastructure projects and, and certainly since you know the, the demise, perhaps, of the, of the postal service. Is that something that you, you've seen a shift within your business? Is that something that, that, is, that is still there? Well, I think within logistics, I think there's still a real war for talent. Um, I, I think the logistics market is um, obviously experienced a huge amount of growth. We operate in a number of sectors, including life sciences, and that is just growing phenomenally at the moment. Um, as you can imagine, we are supporting the, the COVID vaccine rollout. And um, But particularly within logistics, I think it's very much with the employee. I think there's a huge amount of choice. And um, particularly, you know, we're looking for slightly different skill sets amongst our people at the moment. So things like uh, e-commerce knowledge, um, because that's a huge growth area at the moment. If you have, you know, if you have some e-commerce knowledge and logistics, then you can pretty much take your pick at the moment. And 
I think as well, anything to do with automation, you know, people who have automation experience, but also there are transferable skills that, you know, we look at from other industries. So people with large transformational um, program experience or change management or project management or large scale operations. And coming back to that values piece, it's just, you know, people that sort of fit the values as well. But I, I think at the moment, I believe, and this is just my personal experience, but I think it's dependent on industry, obviously, but I do think it is in the, it, well, it seems to be more with the employee at the moment. I, I think there is a, lo a lot of choice, particularly within logistics. Really? And is, is that something that you've experienced as well, Michelle? Yeah, I think people over the last year, certainly, um, a lot of them are not willing to move just yet, but they're disgruntled. They're not entirely happy with the way perhaps that their employers have handled uh, the, the situation with last year around furlough, around um, working from home, around making it easy for people about expectations. And a lot of them don't stop to think, well, actually, this is a brand new ground for the companies as well. We were all learning. All of us were learning on the job on the day, trying to understand yeah. what we needed to do and what needed to be done. Um, so I think there's a lot of candidates who um, are not happy, but will not jump for any job. And certainly when people are going through an interview process for me currently, as Anne just said, if they're good candidates, they've probably got two or three options on the go. And so the offer management side of it becomes extremely important. And I don't think candidates are as driven by money. as Perhaps people think they are. I think it's very, very important, the cultural fit. I think people are looking mm. for stability now more than ever. They're looking to go to a business where they're not going to lose their job in five months. Because so many people have had three or four redundancies on the trot, which is really hard going. And, and you know, mental health suffers going through that, that um, scenario. So I think people are very cautious. They want to be attracted. Um, as Chris said, companies have got to do a bigger sell. They've got to make themselves quite, uh, make themselves open really, and, and, and really tell them what's, what are the pros and cons of working for business. And that's really hard for a business to do because they don't want to talk about any negative sides of it. But I think to get a candidate fully engaged in the process, they need to meet the team. And obviously everything remotely at the moment, it's a little bit more difficult to do that. Um, but to really interact with people who work in the business to understand what their experience of it is, very experience led. So I think candidates yeah. need to be hooked in, kept on that hook and really, not and mind and Tom, but, but you know, really, get a good insight into what a business is about and what it can offer them long term because I think it's a tough decision to make to move from one job to another and even people who yeah. are immediately available aren't necessarily just taking the first job that comes along. It's a really good point Michelle and in, in that same vein it's you know I think companies are so keen to kind of make themselves you know not all companies but so many companies so keen to make themselves look so attractive and so great and everything's brilliant whereas yeah. in real terms the 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 particular you know, candidates will you know will join that business and understand what it is really like and yes. not Very all aspects of any business is is great you know there's every, every business has flaws um but but businesses are either right for some people and they're wrong for, for other people but mm. i think where, where a lot of companies go wrong is is not really worrying about you know just just take down the barriers and just show people who you really are because some people love it other people won't like it but that's great because that's the world we live in and the people that, that that don't like it, then that's fine. There's not a fit there, but we can concentrate on this connection over here. Um, mm. you know, we were working on some video job specs recently for a client and somebody that, that I know, um, sanity check one of those and was like, I don't know if I could work for that person. And it was like, well, that's great because you, you, maybe you can't work for that person. So you can rule yourself out at that nice early stage of the process because that's not right for you. But for someone else, they're thinking, oh, actually, that's... That's exactly the sort of person I'd love to work for, actually. This, this is great. And, and, and like you were saying, Michelle, creating that level of just real transparency is where a lot of companies, I think, could, 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 could do better. And, and, and the quicker they get better at you know, showcasing that transparency, I think mm. they'll just start getting much more success. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a bit like dating. 
Oh, so definitely. Yeah. It is though, isn't it? Because yeah. I think it's a bit like dating because people are ultimately, and not everybody, you know, this is having a luxury of choice. Let's not forget this. Not everybody, you know, has the luxury of, of choosing, you know, we yeah. sometimes we just need a job and, and, you know, but I think if you have the luxury of choice, it is a bit like dating. It's about finding somebody that matches your values, you know, your ethics and you, what you were saying, Michelle, around, it's not just about the money. I think people want a community. They want a community feel, um, not necessarily family because everyone gets on with their family but you know like a community feel where you work with like-minded people you have a business that you know I want to know it's it always it's like shopping isn't it I want to know where my clothes are coming from I want them to be ethically made or sourced yeah. you know where you buy mm. your food from is it fair trade is it you know and it's it's a bit like consuming or dating I think it's around finding that match and to your point Chris not everyone wants to work for the same company and that's fine because we're all different aren't we but yeah. it's around exploring that and you know maybe coming back to what's important to you and is that also important to the company that you want to work for and I think mm. that piece will help you know or it is the longevity isn't it it's having that right match really yeah, yeah absolutely yeah I think what you've said there Anne is 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 really important because it, it's 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 almost like you're saying it's about, well, actually what you've all said, sorry, is, is it, it's about having the bravery to recognise that you've got choice um, as an employee that, you you know, like you said, not everybody has a choice, but it's about having that bravery to say, actually, no, I don't want to work in that organisation. I do want to work. How do we get that bravery into our school children? How do we, how do we actually position that bravery for those people that are coming into the employment market in five years' time, for example. Uh, I'll go to, let's start with Sue. Go on, I can see Sue. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking and think, I mean, it, it's 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 hard it's it's in your role models it's in your it's from their parents it's from their um peer groups parents it's from all those people that have influences on them it's from those youtubers and so and uh social media influencers that they see so regularly it's trying to access them it, and you know we'd be great role models i think for them but are they going to actually, you know, are they? We going to come on into contact with them? We will be, you know, we would do through initiatives like WorkTree that Michelle mentioned earlier, um, but it's that constant reinforcement, isn't it? it? It's like anything. It's it's teachers doing it, and, and yeah, that would be my response. And, and Michelle, what's what's your view on that? You you you've been with WorkTree this morning. Yes, yeah, so um, I started off as a guest for Worktree, which is an employability charity in Milton Keynes, and um, loved it so much. I ended up being, becoming a facilitator for them, and I run sessions for them, and obviously now online, which is very different. Um, and I believe that the way to encourage it in, in students is to go in and talk to them, and to encourage what is effectively networking, because it builds their confidence, it builds their bravery, builds their knowledge, their understanding of the marketplace. Um, and it just takes one or two students, you see the light bulb moment where they go, oh, I didn't know what that job was, or I didn't know that that job existed. I mean, I didn't grow up wanting to be a recruitment consultant. Nobody does. Really? Um, you know, I know, I know. And it's, you know, I don't actually know what I want to be when I grow up, and so I'm still <laughs> going, I'm still working for it. But I think it's that learning about jobs People in businesses making themselves locally available to schools and encouraging interaction and relationships with schools, whether it be through um, a charity that's set up or whether it be a business going directly to a school and saying, we want to sponsor a careers day for you and encouraging those conversations. Because I think the hardest thing is the lack of information. And if students don't have a role model, say a parent, a parent isn't working um, or, or they they're just not motivated in that way it's very difficult for them to think outside of their life experience mm. so I think really we yeah. need to expose students to as much information as possible for them to then go away and consider it and think about it um and and you know yeah. us as businesses to to utilize things like apprenticeship schemes and work experience and all of that I'm very pro getting students out there really What's what's your view, and what's what's the sort of typical age range that that you're bringing into DHL, and and how long do they stay? And yeah, what what's your view as a business? My view is, I think Michelle's spot on. I think it's around giving them access to opportunities and to consider those opportunities. So they need to be 
aware of as many different possibilities as they can be and they need to be empowered to make those choices and I think that starts with making choices around little things very early on what shoes do you want to wear what food do you want to eat who do you want to play with it's around encouraging those responsibility I mean DHL and other logistics companies um, do go into <laughs> primary schools and secondary schools. And we do talk around logistics as a business and we talk around supply chains. I mean, the importance of it, everything in all of your room or my room has come from a supply chain. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely an essential part of our everyday life to steal a strap line mm -hmm. from our training programme. But I think it's around um, getting those touch points early. So, and in answer to your second question, what age do we bring people in? We have graduate schemes, we have degree apprenticeship schemes, which I think are fantastic for young people. You know, you come in, you work in a large organisation, you get a degree at the end of it and you have, you know, zero debt, you're earning a salary. We have work placement schemes where people can come in and study for a year alongside their university degree. And you can also just come and work for us, you know, just, to, just you know, work for us and work your way up. I think logistics is a really good industry for quick progression I think if you are you know a people person and you are interested in how stuff works and how you can make it better I think you can really accelerate very quickly in the logistics industry so I would highly recommend it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Anne you sound like a recruitment poster for that I thought that was yeah even with the salute at the end uh, there we go we want you with the big finger <laughs> Chris, Chris, how, um, how how do you feel about how we encourage um, you know school leavers perhaps into the working environment? Yeah, I, I think it's you know for me it's all about you know trying to just break through perception and glass ceilings for for children. I, I remember vividly being at school as a teenager doing my GCSEs, going on to to do my A levels, but you know just kind of looking at certain career choices and just thinking, no, they're, they're, they're out of my league. They're, you know, I couldn't be a doctor. I don't think I could be an architect, you know, lawyer. You know, I got to a point in my life, probably 12, 13, 14, and you, you start sussing out where you are and just thinking, that's, that's out of my grasp. I don't, I don't think I could do, do that stuff. And, and that's the completely wrong mindset I should have had. Um, and obviously I'm aware of that now. It's a little bit too late because um, I am where I am today. But, but I think... If, if there's an opportunity for just to, to tell more stories to kids about what is possible, what other people have done, you know, people from mm. culturally diverse backgrounds, you know, that are now doing these amazing, wonderful careers in space exploration, in law, in medicine or whatever, that came from really normal backgrounds, like, you know, so many mm. of the kids that, that are around today. And I think the sooner that, that we can tell stories, you know, that, that, you know, of the, these amazing stories that, that, that these kids could learn from, where they're thinking, oh, wow, okay, well, I'm just, you know, this person from this little village doing this little thing and haven't, you know, grown up in a particularly privileged, you know, way, but wow, nor did that person. And, you know, they've just gone on a space rocket to Mars, you know, and, and, and actually, I, I think the sooner we can get more stories plugged into these kids about what, what is possible, I think that's when we'll start breaking through glass ceilings, smashing perception, and I think it's it's kids realizing that they, they can kind of do anything really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's fantastic, Chris. What you said, I think, you know, just summing up what what you said is, you know, is we used to have the phrase that the sky's the limit. Well, there should be no limit, should there? It, it's it's limitless. We can go wherever we wherever we want. It's just your imagination is really the limit, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And I don't know if it's the same thing for you guys, but like careers advice, that's another key thing, isn't it? The, the careers advice system in mm. schools. Yeah. Um, and you, don't, you don't want to go on one of those rants where you're complaining and about everything's broken, but but there probably is a, a redesigning of, of that process, isn't there? Where kids, you know, going into that that careers advice situation where I forget how old they are when, when they do that, but there, there's probably a bit of room for improvement around around that whole system as well. I, I, I'm a little bit like um, like Michelle. I went into some schools a few years ago, and, and I was absolutely staggered. It wasn't in perhaps the best area of, of the town that I live in, but I, I was staggered by the lack of aspiration. Perhaps of, of they didn't want to move beyond the catchment of their school. 
Um, but now that we've got this open world where with social media, with the news, with the press, with media, everything else, this you can see beyond all of those boundaries. So it must be that, or, or one would hope that, that that would really bring in some of the aspiration and, and change perhaps, or, or, or change the aspirations of, of people with, um, you know, perhaps that, that sort of mindset. I think, I think everything that, that the four of you have said so far is really, really positive about what the future looks like. So I'm going to bring it round to um, the question that we're here to answer. What is employment going to look like in 5, 10, 20 years' time? Take your pick, whichever year it is, but let's think outside the box. And, Michelle, I'm going to come to you. I started with you um, earlier on this evening. I'm going to come back to you just to show that I'm not in alphabetical order this evening. <laughs> When I thought about the answer to that question, I kind of went down a bit of a rabbit hole and got a bit maudlin and thought, oh, what jobs won't exist? Like we, mm. Will we have travel agents mm. in yep. 10 years? You know, we talked about things like you don't book a hotel anymore, you go on to Airbnb, don't you? And it's and it's making those jobs obsolete at some point. Um, so I don't know. I think technology, we talked about um, uh, video job specs, video interviewing is a really big thing at the moment. Um, some people really like it. Some people are really, really averse to the technology at this point in time. Um, and so I think there's going to be this whole, I don't know, I, I feel a little bit like the cultural piece will move on and then it will revert back again to people looking for job satisfaction and happiness. I think more than anything at the moment, People want work-life balance and they want to be happy in their job. I think on the on the um, session I did in school this morning, three of our guests said life's too short. And that's the biggest lesson that most of us have probably learnt over the past year or so. Um, and so it's about making good choices. And I don't think people will jump around in jobs perhaps as much as they have done previously because I think they will want stability, a feeling of comfort um, and a feeling of being able to progress and improve them. Um, and, and attain an achievement because I don't know that there are many people who say that they've achieved a hell of a lot in the last year um, you know we've all kind of felt like we're standing still and we might be working very hard and doing very well in our roles and our businesses might be growing but I think as individuals people are feeling a little bit dissatisfied so I think in five years time people will have been making or in the five years lifestyle choices and career moves based on um, good mental health positivity and happiness wow and, and what about yourself Anne? I love that what Michelle you... just by the way yeah. um I think it's I, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about the automation that we currently use because I think there is a bit of a um um people are a bit nervous around the word automation and you know what will happen but I was thinking about it tonight as I used the self-service till at Tesco to buy my milk before I came here you know that's automation isn't it as I went running and had the little GPS in my watch that's automation sat nav in your car's automation so I don't think it means that it is necessarily scary and we have automation in logistics you know we have virtual reality uh, we're using it a lot for onboarding and training around health and safety and we use it to model new warehouses and we've got some really clever stuff going on um, and often I think the automation at the moment is used to get rid of repetitive tasks to enable us to do the human things so the problem solving or the creativity or the face-to-face -face or the you know the, the customer relationship piece so I don't think that automation is something yet to be um, scared of, I think it is a positive thing. But um, yeah, I think I think coming back to Michelle's point, I think what what recent events have shown us is that working from home is possible, remote working is possible. When people said it wasn't, and that in itself, I think, will create a hugely diverse talent pool. I think it will hopefully open up opportunities to also, you know, you know, people that couldn't afford to live in a capital city, people that couldn't afford a car, people that couldn't afford travel, physically disabled people that couldn't get somewhere or buildings weren't fit for purpose. I think that hopefully this will have a real shift in the, 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 the makeup of, of, of the workforce, I think, I hope. Yeah, I hope, I hope that as well. I agree with you, Anne, yeah. Yeah, but what about you, Sue? Where, where do you think it's gonna go? So I agree with both what Michelle and Anne have said, and, and I hope that we will have some sort of hybrid future. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be 
uh, we use the trains less, we're going to be using the buses less. So, you know, all of those sort of things are, are changing. Everything is changing. We could, as you said earlier, Matthew, we could work wherever we want to in the world, perhaps not in Europe now because of Brexit, but we can work wherever we want and still be, um, you know, doing work in the UK, if that makes sense. So all of those gates, I think, have been opened. People's eyes have been opened. But I think Michelle said about, you know, the happiness side of it, life is too short. And I think people will, they might not move right away. Um, they will let the dust settle. But I think that people will remember how they were treated last year, um, this year, um, how, you know, those discussions about furlough or whether there was actually a discussion about furlough or whether they were just told um, how much they were communicated with during furlough, um, the amount of work they had to do if they were working and not on furlough. All of those sort of things will come to the, you know, once things have got back to whatever normal looks like, um, those things will be important to people, how they were made to feel, how they were treated, and people will make decisions on that and they will walk, they will find, a, um, they will move to self-employed, they will, you know, those little um, businesses that they've started on, on the side, um, they, they might come to fruition or they might decide it's not, you know, what they're going through in the employed relationship isn't worth um, the unhappiness they're feeling and they'll go for it or they'll find an employer who fits their values. But I do think there'll be movement. I, I really do. I think there will be some sort of um, technology. I mean, the artificial intelligence will come. I don't think it will wipe us all out. I don't think that it will remove the need for actual people, but there will probably be some jobs that can be done um, and can be fully automated. Um, there probably are some now, but I think there will be more of a shift towards using robots in those very task orientated ways. But I don't think they will ever, well, I hope they will ever replace the actual person um, however, um, the uh, grounds that they make on artificial intelligence. Um, but yeah, who knows, in 20 years time, if I'm invited back, I'll probably be a, be a robot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, what, what's, what's your feeling? Yeah, well, look, some really great points there. And I, I agree with um, the points from Anne, Michelle and, and Sue. Um, I, I think that the focus, like all, all three have already said, around employee wellness and happiness, I think that is gonna be front and center, you know, for the next five, 10 and, and forever more. I think there hasn't been enough focus on, on that real critical subject for, you know, from what I've seen anyway, in, in lots of the companies that we work with for, for a long time. And, and I think that that is now becoming front and center. And I think companies that, that realize if they, if they really double down on that, it's not only great for the employees, you know, just feeling great, you know, they're, they're all, it's also great for the businesses, you know, they're, they're going to be a lot more productive and just in much better headspace, much better culture, environment, people, will, you know, you know, work for companies for longer periods of time and stuff. So the, you know, the, I suppose, which you don't want to talk about that, but for businesses, the ROI for actually doubling down and making sure everyone's in good headspace, headspace is enormous. Um, I also think, from a talent attraction perspective, I think one of the, the big moves that I kind of think that we'll probably see moving into the, the next five years or so will be companies realising that if they, you know, it, it's using their internal workforce to promote how great those businesses are to, to attract talents. You're already seeing, you know, people, you know, TikTok, Instagram stories, whatever, you know, working in particular teams at particular places and, you know, getting so many eyeballs of activity of, of relevant people that, that could work in those businesses actually starting to see from these kind of almost micro influencers that work in these businesses um, starting to leverage on, you know, that their attraction campaigns on them, on, on their internal workforce, as opposed to thinking, right, how can we spend loads of cash on recruitment marketing to attract people yeah. when actually you've got an entire workforce that yeah. could be doing a ton of that work for you if you engage them in the right way. And I think that will be a shift in the next five years or so. Fantastic. Um, I, I'm, I've been blown away by the conversation this evening. I've been, I'm, I'm really on the periphery of this. I've not, I've not been employed for eight years. <laughs> I, um, I, I, yeah, I've just been blown away by the whole topic of the, of the conversation. Uh, sadly, we're, we're running out of time um, this evening. So 
I think if we, we look back at the conversation we've had this evening, and I've made so many notes, but there's been some really, really positive um, points that have come out of it. One of the things that, that really strikes me is, is this value-led employment, um, where we're actually going to be employing people on a, a much more, um, or we could be employing people on a much more pastoral um, way of employment. It's going to be much more values led. It's going to be people that are a fit for the culture of the business and the, and the business. Uh, people are actually having the bravery to say, actually, yes or no, I'm I'm not a fit, or I am a fit for, you, for your business as well. Um, and and that that seems really positive to me. Um, to be able to actually say my work life balance is critically important, my mental health is critically important, and this is what I choose to do with the skills that I have, and recognise that. I'm giving my time, which is worth something to you in return for your money and um, my experience in turn for what you actually need is it, it really levels up the employment contract, doesn't it? Um, and I think I think that's that's really exciting from from what you from what you've said. One of the things that jumped out at me, and for those of you who, who perhaps have spoken to me in the past, I've quoted this number before, um, 2,304 Monday mornings are the average number of Monday mornings that we have to get up and go to work on. From the conversation we've changed tonight, I'm going to have to sit down and do my maths again because that was till I was 65. Now I'm going to have to work it out until I'm 70 or 75 plus. But I think... Everything that you've said is let's find a job wherever possible that makes us happy, doing whatever we want to do, that encourages us all to have that balance of, of, um, of enjoying the work that we're doing, wherever that is. And, you know, we can all enjoy the work that we're doing to a certain extent um, and then seeing it as a fair exchange with the with the employer. And I think that's that's a fair enough um, summation of, of what we've said. I'm really, really grateful to all four of you this evening. And the, the conversation has been absolutely fantastic. Has anyone in the room got anything else that they want to add out of all four of you at the moment before we sign off? I'm just looking around the room. No? No. Um, and I hope that, as it wasn't alphabetically, I hope that was fine for you and I didn't put you on the spot. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for um, for everything that you've brought into the conversation. And thank you too so much for um, seeing, seeing everything from a slightly different side. Sue, the HR side of things um, that, that you brought to the conversation, again, really, really valuable. And Chris, your your insight into, into where we're going to go and, and the talent acquisition, it's all been fantastic. So thank you all very, very much for this evening. It only remains for me to say that um, the Future Thinkers are going to be back on uh, the 6th of April. Our topic um, on next month is going to be, wait for it, this coincides with everyone being released from lockdown on the 29th of March. But our topic is going to be the future of the high street. What is that going to look like? Um, and again, it's really about thinking outside the box. What is it going to look like in 20 years time? We've seen so many changes on our high street from uh, Topshop leaving the high street, Devon's leaving the high street over the last couple of years. I'm showing how often I go shopping now because I can't think of any other names. Um, but to where we have perhaps the charity shops on the high street and how's it going to be? Are we actually going to be looking at something completely different? Are they going to be entertainment zones? So that's going to be our topic on the 6th of April. Please do join us. Thank you to all of our guests this evening. This has been the Future Thinkers. Thank you and good night. <laughs>